All right, good morning, everybody. Let's get started. Um, my name is Jan Guerra. I teach Intro to Marketing. Welcome to this classroom. Welcome to this Power Hour. Uh, Temple and Klein are so excited to share uh, our two presenters with you today. Uh, we have Ben Jankowski, who is the Senior Vice President of Media for MasterCard, and he's on the Board of Visitors for Temple. And we have Pete Jones, who's the Executive Creative Director for McCann. Uh, we've been working over the past couple weeks to put this together, and I'm so excited with all the different things they're gonna share with you. Um, if you could, in terms of housekeeping, if you have any questions that you'd like to run by them, uh, send me a private chat and I will put them together and we'll have some lively discussion at the end of the presentation. So with that, Ben, are you kicking us off? Pete is actually. Oh, Pete, oh, Pete is kicking us off. I'm like, okay. Um, hi everybody, thanks for uh, having us and uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to you on the Power Hour. Um, very unconventional, I guess, uh, these times to do these uh, presentations. Um, but uh, a quick introduction um, as to who I am and why I'm here. Um, Pete Jones, uh, Executive Creative Director. And if you can't hear me or see me or whatever, please let me know quickly. On uh, slide three, uh, I work for uh, McCann XBC, and we are part of the McCann network, and we have uh, 180 offices um, in 120 cities. We're a global agency, uh, one of the biggest networks uh, in the world. Uh, very lucky to be a part of this group. Um, in case anybody doesn't know, on slide four, McCann has a long reputation of being a great agency, but also in sometimes being a, you know, evil empire. We were depicted in uh, Mad Men as being the, uh, the bad agency, the sellout agency. We invented uh, the great campaigns like the Coca-Cola uh, Mean Joe Green, commercial uh, amongst um, uh, L'Oreal, um, Is She Worth It, or You're Worth It uh, campaign. A lot of great work. It's been around since the 1920s. Uh, on slide uh, five is just a little bit about my journey there. I graduated in 92. Um, I was, uh, I always show this when I talk to advertising students. Um, I was not the best uh, academically. Um, graduated with a 3.0. I say 3.0, it's a 2.9. I raise it up to a 3.0. Um, I was on academic probation, but I got lucky. Um, at some point in my, I guess, uh, collegiate journey, I saw a Nike commercial and I realized that's uh, probably what I wanted to do. And I took a advertising course and it was the first time I ever got an A. Um, and from there, I had a great group of mentors and teachers. Um, Dr. Mara was uh, someone I still have stayed in touch with and has been a great uh, sort of uh, influence while I was there. And thereafter, um, graduated in 92 uh, into a great recession. And it took a while to get a job. Uh, but I tried very hard, started off in Baltimore, uh, then moved up to Philadelphia. And eventually got to where I wanted to be, which was New York. And uh, got hired at McCann Erickson. Uh, and then uh, bounced around a little bit and was lucky enough to um, come back to McCann and uh, work there on um, a few big accounts, which you'll see on uh, slide six. McCann um, had a big sort of portfolio of, of clients like Verizon, Microsoft, I worked on Major League Baseball, Nikon, Goldman Sachs, uh, 
and then eventually worked on MasterCard and lucky enough to work on the Priceless campaign. So that's my, my short journey in five minutes. And <laughs> it's, it, it feels like um, it, it was a very short journey, but it, it was over the course of 20 years and glad to be here to hopefully inspire and influence and encourage anyone who's listening to do the same. Off to you, Ben. Oh, you wanted to, you were going to show the mascara, right? Right. Yeah, I was, I was uh, going to show up a little bit of the MasterCard reel, uh, which uh, the campaign started in 1998, I think. And here's just a, a few things that sort of launched the campaign and sort of the uh, favorites, um, but also just to show how uh, things are so different than when that campaign started. So, you want to check it? I had it. I lost it. There we go. Sorry. I'm AV guy today, so. There are some things my hair can buy for discount stores. There's not to be part of Extra hotel night in New England. Going down, man. Try to have free. Oh, floor. Get a massage today. I'm excited. Extra night in Cleveland. Delicious cut. Free. Good call. I'll just cut it up, turn it into a fruit salad or something. Thanks. Extra night in San Diego. Morning. Hey, guy. Free. You know, I'm going to do that. Getting world class rewards no matter who you are. Whether you're sweet, nice to face. Get a world master card and get free hotel stays and more. Send a personalized sweet talk from Peyton at Priceless.com. Now they have some fun with these walls. Do you want a golf tip? Sure, do it. Get a master card. It gets you lessons with pros. Oh, <laughs> CPC golf courses. You hit the card! It may be even a priceless surprise. Not everybody hits the seat on Watson. That was awesome. We put that over 400 million vacation days go unused every year. Really? That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. That makes me laugh. Do you need vacation days? That's awesome. You sure you have your excuses? For all reasons for wanting to travel, or better inquiry. If you guys agree to travel more, well, you'll be better at school. There have been studies. Well, how will I understand the little culture? I will learn to follow from set. Really? I want to see the sun. I want to see the mountains. Your friends. I want to see the forest. New Jersey. I need vitamin D. Vacation. So not asking for much. Just for one more day. One more day. One more day. Just one day. For no planning your one more day, contact MasterCard Concierge Services or download our new app. Because one more day is priceless. I always love to get a fan's story and to also surprise them. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You have a MasterCard? You could get a priceless surprise. Concert tickets, trips, even a visit just in Zoom. Hey, man. So that's just a quick sample of some of the things we've done. Um, on the next slide is uh, just a reminder of tone of voice. 
to make sure that uh, you know you want to talk to people in a genuine, authentic way. And uh, particularly on the Priceless campaign, we always try to do that, uh, as Ben knows very well. Yep. So I'm going to talk a little bit, do a quick intro. Um, I'm uh, also Temple grad, older than Pete, got out in 1982, um, before all of you, most of you were born. Um, made, like Pete made the difficult call of like left Temple, um, do I go to, you know, you know, work outside of New York and then work my way up to New York or go straight to New York? I made the tough call to go straight to New York, work for big ad agencies for, uh, for 28 years, which is a really long time. Um, back in, you know, back in the day, media agencies, media departments used to be part of big agencies. Now they're all separate. So worked for two or three big creative agencies and then worked for um, a couple media agencies. And then um, nine years ago, made the move, uh, jumped the side of the you know desk and moved from agency side to client side. Uh, today, I work at MasterCard where I help the company manage all of our paid media. So a little bit about me, um, I'm lucky to have, I have an amazing wife and two wonderful kids. Um, that's me with my um, Luke Klein Excellence in Media Award in 2017. I'm also a huge sports fan. My friends Gritty and Fanatic. Um, I was in um, U.S. Bank Stadium when the Eagles won the Super Bowl. And yes, I put on a tuxedo when I had the opportunity to have my picture taken with the Vince Lombardi trophy. That was way more important than half the other times I've, 90% of the other times I've worn tuxedos for events. The, having it taken with the Vince Lombardi Trophy, very important. Um, so that's me. Um, want to talk a little bit about the media landscape and just a couple slides. Um, one of the things I want to impress upon people is obviously the market's changed a lot. Um, less, you know, traditional TV, more digital, things like that. Everything's digital nowadays. But media usage is not a zero-sum game. Right, and you can see from the slide in the US, it's only a slight increase from 12 hours a day to you know 12 hours and seven minutes to 12 hours and 15 minutes. So it's a small increase. Wanted to make a couple points. One is 12 hours a day. And whenever, I, and I'm an adjunct instructor and I teach an intro to media class, just like Jen teaches one as well. When I talk to people about, students about media usage, it's always like, well, I don't consume a lot of media. I do a little bit of like Pinterest and, you know, Facebook. And, but if you really think about and one of my first projects, I asked my students is to spend a week and think about your media behavior. Average person's 12 hours a day. If you sleep six hours a day, then two thirds of the time you're spending while you're awake is consuming media. Um, and that number continues to go up. U S examples here. But in other countries, China, India, some of the developed countries, the amount of time spent in media is going up 10, 15% a year. So when we think about that, we think about our challenge in, as marketers, the challenge is how do we reach people? How do we get people to where focused and dedicated? When's the last time if you sit in, you're a student in any class, and I know my classes, I'd say 60% of the students, if not more, have their mobile phones out. Maybe they're taking notes. Maybe they're texting a friend. Maybe they're playing, uh, you know, maybe they're playing the game. But it's very, very difficult to reach people in a fully dedicated environment. But I think about even myself today, when I'm watching linear television, and I'm a sports fan, so I watch a lot of sports. I've been suffering last month. Um, I've always, I've got my phone. I've got my tablet. I'm always consuming you know, media. So when you think about when your job it is, when your job's to impact and reach people, they're not sitting there waiting for your brilliance to show up on the TV screen. You have to work really hard at trying to find ways to, to impact them. Um, the other thing I want to focus on is it's a $600 billion industry. It's one of the most dynamic industries um, going and it continues to grow at a faster rate than any like economic indicators. If you look at categories that grow, media always grows at 
roughly double the rate of the world's gross domestic, domestic can't talk, gross domestic product. Why? Because there's constantly marketers who are trying to compete for, you know, fewer and fewer impressions, right? It's harder to reach people and you've got so much money trying to chase them. So the media industry is, is really dynamic, the $600 billion industry. And the good news is there's some really good parts of this. One of the things is there's a lot more choices. Like back in the day when dinosaurs were on the earth and I was starting out in this business, a client would pick up the phone, they'd call their agency, they would call a TV company and all of a sudden you could see it from the little exhibit on the right. And all of a sudden you get to see, you know, consumers get to see an ad. Today in the digital space, and I'm showing a really small image of something called a LumaScape chart. If you wanted to really freak yourself out, go Google LumaScape charts. There's 5,000 companies in the digital ecosystem. Um, so the good news is there's 5,000 companies to work for and there's lots of jobs roaming around out there. But the bad news from our standpoint, from a marketer standpoint, our jobs are really hard. Um, doing a great job in integrated marketing and digital is exponentially harder than it used to be. Um, ratings are down. Um, there's more choices, which makes the world really, really, really fragmented. There's also a huge amount of risk, right? So a lot of the things you guys have all seen, those websites you kind of get clickbaited into, those are just there to drive advertising impressions. No one's spending any time creating content. They're just, you know, packaging, you know, packaging snippets of innocuous information and trying to force you to click onto a site so they can make money. So the point is really dynamic industry. There's a lot of things going on. Um, and um, our jobs are really a lot harder than they used to be. A lot harder to reach a lot of people, a lot harder to drive scale. Um, but then again, the good news is it's a dynamic industry. I can't imagine what I would be doing if I wasn't doing this because I still love it even after, you know, 38 years. Um, and there's lots of opportunities out there. So that's the good news if you're senior out there looking for your next uh, adventure. Um, but you think about the consumer. So consumers are, I think the technical word for it is, you know, they're pissed off at advertising, right? They see over 700 ads a day. Um, the attention span is non-existent. And in turn, they're using things like, they're using 615, this chart says 615 million. Now it's probably a little bit higher than that, are using ad blockers. So 615 million is roughly 30% of this country, 25% of this country are using ad blockers. They're going out of their way to not see ads. Um, 85 million people subscribe to, you know, uh, streaming services or video services that don't have ads. So people are going out of their way, they're paying so they can avoid seeing ads. So what do we do about that? I think one of my one of my favorite data points is this data point, which came from the consultancy of, I think it came from McKinsey. 10 years ago, cons brands had two thirds of all the touch points that were out there. If you looked at all the communication, two thirds of them were brand led. Advertising, promotions, in-store, all that great stuff. Today, it's completely flipped. The volume has gone up exponentially, but now two thirds of the touch points are consumer led. All the things we do in social media, all the things we do with influencers and ambassadors and all the things that we do, everybody's a content creator today. So how do we deal with, and Pete kind of talked about it. We talked about how advertising's changed. How do we deal with it in terms of, we can't talk to the consumer in a one way communication like it used to be back in, back when McCann was formed in the 1920s. Now we have to be a lot more, a lot more interactive. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Pete um, and we're gonna, he's gonna talk about some work that he, uh, that he admires. <laughs> well, there's so many slides that Ben had that make me feel like it's depressing. Like we have no chance. We can never get through, we can never do anything good. Um, the world has changed. No one's paying attention to us. And he's absolutely right. Um, but I just feel like it's, it's an opportunity. A, Don't be depressed. It is. That's exactly right. It, there's opportunity. And, um, uh, and I just wanted to go to slide 17. Uh, there are certain principles that still are relevant. Um, if you are inventive, if you're inspiring and you're intrusive, you will break through. 
it doesn't matter what era um, you're working in. It doesn't matter what platform you're working in. If you sort of um, figure out how to um, be uh, creative, inventive, inspiring, intrusive, do not do what everybody else does. You will break through. Have any of you seen a bad Nike ad? <laughs> somehow, somehow they've managed to succeed uh, since 1979, 1980. So there's just some um, work um, actually on 18, um, it's just a slide that shows how the media landscape has changed so much. And uh, in, in my lifetime from, not my lifetime, from graduating from Temple, but none of these things existed. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Netflix, YouTube, TikTok. I don't even understand TikTok, um, but we'll try to figure it out. Um, and I rely on people who are half my age to show me creative ideas that we will put on the TikTok platform. Um, then again, you know, talking about like being creative and being in, uh, intrusive, inventive. On slide 19, our agency created Fearless Girl. And what's amazing about Fearless Girl is this is um, a statue made out of bronze. And bronze dates back to, I don't know how many thousands of years. Um, it's not the most uh, technologically advanced um, execution ever, but it was smart. It was uh, a great placement. It was done at a perfect time uh, right after the elections. It was launched on, um, forgive me, I believe it was uh, National Women's Day. I'm not sure. Um, and it was placed in front of the uh, stock, mar stock market bowl. So inventive, um, innovative and uh, intrusive uh, can take any shape or form. Uh, so I, I, I think that any time can be a time for great creativity. Um, on 21 is one of my favorite campaigns. I, it's a little dated, it may be um, five years old. It's called Dumb Ways to Die. And I imagine the creatives were briefed on something to talk about uh, safety on railways, which could be like oh, a very boring thing to do. Um, but what our uh, McCann uh, sister agency in Sydney did was a agnostic campaign um, that um, I, I guess it exposed itself and manifested itself in so many different ways. So if you want to just show that one, it's a great way of creativity and at uh, any time. Some people don't listen to public safety messages. So how do you get them to care about being safe around trains? By turning your message into a cultural phenomenon. The idea was simple. Being unsafe around trains is the dumbest thing you could ever do. A song was written called Dumb Ways to Die. A video of the song was released online and within a week had over 20 million YouTube views with absolutely no paid media support at all. Content was made for Tumblr, Instagram and SoundCloud and generated huge and immediate viral effect. Within days, Dumb Ways to Die became the world's most shared video, and within a month, the sixth most shared advertisement the world had ever seen. The song was put on iTunes and climbed the charts in over 20 countries. This was more than earned me. People were paying money to own this advertisement. Radio stations all over the world played it as content. The video was picked up by every television network in the country. People shared their own versions of the song. Made parodies, created all kinds of content. 
Schools everywhere adopted the campaign. Just six weeks after the launch, total views of the film, including repostings and cover versions, neared 50 million. Dumb Ways to Die became the most shared public service campaign in history, and a message that people needed to hear had become a message that people wanted to hear. So many dumb, so many dumb ways to die. Thanks, Ramson. A message from Metro. Um, on the uh, next slide is something that is very new. Um, it was launched uh, this year and proud to show something from uh, my favorite brand, MasterCard. <laughs> Handing over my card makes me feel very anxious and nervous. Just a total invalidation of my identity. I tried not to focus on that because it happens so often. I used to have moments of anxiety and moments of panic. It puts me in a place where I feel like I'm in danger. It just sucks every single time. They look at it and they look at you. And they look at it and they look at you. Oh, is this actually you? Are you serious? Oh my God. Stop. That's so cool. That's incredible. That's who I am. That's who I actually am. Uh, True Name Card is uh, uh, something that took over a year to actually produce um, with a lot of help from um, the gang at MasterCard to find a bank that would issue a card where transgender um, individuals would be able to put their chosen name on the front of their card because uh, it's so hard to change your name. Uh, it's, a, it's a big process. And uh, I, I, I love this idea because the brand actually went out and did something um, and it's connected to an actual product. Then uh, next thing is uh, REI. Sorry. Um, sometimes you don't do an ad, you just do an action. And REI opt outside was a great action. Taking a stand against the Black Friday frenzy, a major retailer is refusing to open on Black Friday this year. REI. REI. Capital retailer REI. All of its locations will be closed on Black Friday. And it won't be processing any sales online. It will pay employees to take Black Friday off to spend time outdoors. This Black Friday, we're closing all 143 of our stores. We'd rather be in the mountains than in the aisle. Join us on November 27th and I'll be outside. More retailers are joining REI, deciding to close their doors on Black Friday.
I'm sorry, just quickly, the last one is uh, something that I always like to share with anyone going into um, advertising, especially on the creative side. A lot of times when you get an assignment for like a banner or a brochure, creatives will moan and say, I don't want to do a banner. I don't want to do a brochure that's boring. Um, but this was a brochure that was done for a solar company. And the only way you could read it was when you could go outside uh, and sunlight would make the type appear. So it's just another example of uh, creative opportunity and uh, uh, doesn't always have to be a great big film. Right. So what I wanted to try to do, and Pete showed some amazing content um, that was, you know, inventive, inspiring, and intrusive as to talk about. I want to talk about like more about the need to be fully integrated, right? So consumers don't think of, you know, single media types. Consumers don't think of like, I only consume media on Facebook, Pinterest, TikTok, whatever, you know, name your favorite channel. They consume everything in a fully integrated way. So the way for us to succeed, and I really want to focus on you guys to think about, it's never one campaign. It's, it's never like one media platform. It's, it's always got to be an integrated campaign that takes, in, takes into consideration a variety of things. And it always starts with what your client's trying to accomplish. If I'm trying to drive awareness, I'm going to do something different than if I'm trying to drive, you know, signups to my website. So depending upon what the business priority, the second imperative is knowing what your consumers are all about. And it sounds like it's not as simple as, I mean, the basic versions are just knowing the basic demographics and psychographics, but a really deep understanding of your consumers, how they're behaving, what they're doing at certain touch points, depending upon your message, you know, cross-border travel, tra travel is an important, it's MasterCard's biggest category, right? So it's important for us to really understand travelers and really try to, if we can integrate and build loyalty, amongst heavy travelers, it'll be a tremendous business advantage. So it's not just knowing who the people are that are on planes a lot. You know, we've done a whole travel consumer journey around when do people plan? Because their behavior when they're planning is different than when they're actually booking the trip, when they're actually going on the trip, when they're actually in the location, when they're actually on site. And then after, they're, after the, the trip's over, their work is not done because then you're going to tell all your friends about it. And that's when the social media, you know, starts happening when you, when you recapture. So that consumer journey of understanding the real depths, I'm going to show a rugby example in a second, the consumer journey around, it's not just rugby fans, rugby fans who were watching before the game or at the stadium versus in a pub. So it's the complete understanding of the consumer is the most important thing that you have to kind of understand because you can't create a campaign if you don't know what your consumers are. And then beyond that, you have to integrate every single aspect. And this little wheel here um, talks about all the different components. You obviously have to have great creative. If you don't have great creative, then it's not going to be powerful. Also have to have great data insights about how to reach people. You have to have, you know, great media plan, great media technology. I've talked about those 5,000 companies. Having great technology so that you can learn and optimize and measure results and things like that. In the case of the example I'm going to show you, we leveraged other assets. We leveraged important, you know, MasterCard is a very experiential brand. Priceless was rooted in a consumer insight that experiences matter more than things. When our competitors 20 some years ago, when our competitors were talking about membership has its privileges and everywhere you want to be, very capitalistic things, we were talking about you know, we were talking about priceless and how, you know, it was more important to have experience. So we're very experientially driven. And as such, we do a lot of sponsorship things. We do, and I'm going to show you an example in a second about rugby. But we sponsor Major League Baseball. We sponsor the Grammys. We sponsor a lot of chefs. And, you know, we, we spend a lot of energy being, being experiential marketers. And we have a lot of sponsorship assets. The last thing about the integrated wheel is, um, is research, 
right? If you can't measure success, if you don't know ahead of time what your success measure is, and I, and I, when I teach my class, I bang on all the time about being very specific objective. If you say, I want to grow awareness, growing my awareness 1% versus growing my awareness 30%, very different job and very different task. And if you don't know what you're trying to measure, if you don't know what success looks like, you can't develop a plan. So I don't mean to sound like the research wonk, um, but it's like you have to really think about, you know, think about your measurement plan. Measurement is not an accident. You do, and trust me, I've seen it, not only, at, you know, with students, but I've seen it in real life. He can smile or like hide his head because he knows that MasterCard does this more than we should. We'll do a campaign. We'll see what results look the best. And then we'll say that was our success. You can't do it that way. You got to really think about how do you drive success uh, at the very beginning. It's the most important thing to think about. Um, so I want to show one example. If I get my computer screen to move. Oh, no. Uh-oh. Come on. That's a problem. Huh. Sorry, guys. I was doing so. Well. There we go. Now it's going to move five slides in one. So wanted to show the wheel, around, like, you know, the wheel, it's literally one page. I could spend, I spent two years planning the Rugby World Cup, which is the third biggest sporting event in the world. Um, happens every four years. It just happened last year. I spent two years planning it. That's the other thing. One of the things about integrated campaigns, and Jan would talk about this, takes a tremendous effort of a lot of people. It doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't happen with just one agency kind of running point doing all the work. It's a truly integrated effort, but you'll get a, you're going to get amazing results. So Rugby World Cup happened um, 20, uh, last, last year, right? So 20, um, 2019, um, it was, and we did everything around, we did a, a lot of different things. So from the consumer insight, I talked about the consumer was the most important thing not just sports fans, but we dissected who were hardcore rugby fans, who were casual fans who in a market like Japan, which isn't a really big rugby market, how do we make casual sports fans really passionate about the game? Obviously creative. We had to do great, impactful creative at every for every platform. We had great TV videos that we showed. We also had amazing digital. We had a good balance of, we had brand messages, things that we created for ourselves, we also used the power of ambassadors. We had a lot of great rugby ambassadors. Uh, Dan Carter is the Michael Jordan of rugby, and he was one of our ambassadors. Uh, so we had six or seven ambassadors lined up, and them telling an authentic message about us is a lot more powerful than us, right? If you think about, if you ask consumers what's the most important you know, source of information, they're always going to say they're friends and their family. So when you think about things like ambassadors or influencers, they're more important in some cases than our brand. We can't just have them driving our whole brand. We have to have a good mix of great brand messaging. We also have to have ambassadors and influencers who are out there being able to tell your story. Um, if I roll down a little bit, start to move from the top right down into the, into the, the, the bottom right, we used every single media type from subways to airplanes going, you know, um, from, we had great, all, you know, all forms of digital, we had a big TV campaign, um, you know, and, and things like that. Also moving across, we also did at every touch point. So we had stunts, we had big PR events in public places. We had retail promotions. We had media owners who helped us, you know, media owners drag, we had radio stations who brought people to retail locations to get people to, come listen to one of our sports ambassadors. And while they're at it, they can buy all kinds of great uh, Rugby World Cup gear. We also had an amazing event. We talked about the Rugby World Cup. It's the third largest sporting event in the world. We also had a great asset. So every single marketer has one part of, you know, if you're a Rugby World Cup sponsor and there were 10 of them, everybody got their pick of, you need to negotiate what your pick was. We decided to do the player of the match trophy. I'll talk about that in a second. We thought it was really important. Some of the other choices were um, DHL, the courier company. They used to, they were the sponsor of the match ball. So they have a little DHL truck that would ride out in the middle of the field. The referee would pick it up. Uh, Heineken had the coin flip. So they flipped the coin and the coin would fall onto a Heineken logo 
um, Emirates had the referee's uniform. You know, and we decided the player of the match was really important because it had a lot more potential to be a big social media phenomenon. So we had a great event. We leveraged a great asset. And then again, I talked about before, the top left, we measured everything. Social media, we did everything, all the impressions, click through rates, video views, all that traditional stuff that you would do. Uh, we also measured sentiment. We had 90% positive sentiment. And if you think about people complaining and whining about brands, having 90% sentiment is, that's unheard of. Um, we also measured brand lift. Um, and then we targeted every, you know, we, we worked every possible, uh, every possible line. Um, so one of the other things we did was we had content we delivered over 825 pieces of content, right? And a lot of that was just changing social messages. We worked very hard at planning every single action, right? So whenever something happened, we were prepared to create a great piece of content. Again, took a tremendous amount of work, but we had a plan. Every day, we had a plan across what our influencers were talking about, what the brand was talking about, what our ambassadors were talking about. It was a very thoughtful, integrated plan what we did before, during, and after games. But the point is, that's a well thought out, you know, that takes a lot of time and effort to, to think that through. Um, the other thing we talked about is this player of the match asset. So basically, we were able to give a trophy at the end of the game to the best player of the game. So we turned that into, through some cool technology and great innovation from one of our agency partners, we turned that into a social media phenomenon. Because what we did was we took the trophy and it was shaped like a piece of origami. The event was in Japan. We were smart in how we designed the trophy. Um, and I could talk about this for 40 minutes and I can't. So I'm just giving you the real quick version. Um, and we actually engraved the highlights of the game onto the trophy in real time. So at the end of the game, five minutes after the game, the player of the match got the trophy and it already had the highlights of the game already etched onto the trophy. So that's a really, really cool piece of innovation. Um, and we got lots of, you know, lots of publicity just because we were innovative and we were able to deliver a trophy that had highlights of the game five minutes after the game. We also turned it into a huge social phenomenon, right? We turned it into every time something happened around the game, um, we were able to, um, you know, make it a social media, you know, make it a social media message. We stayed relevant because every time something happened in the game, we could flip out, hey, Pete Jones just had an amazing try to put the United States ahead of Tonga. Should Pete be the player, the MasterCard player of the match? So if we just did constantly as the game went on, we constantly refreshed our, our communication and kept that player of the match and MasterCard relevant, we were driving higher social media engagement. So we had a whole bunch of elements into this in terms of how we delivered the, you know, the, we delivered the trophy, which was really cool. We also made a huge social media event, which during the game, which helped us drive engagement. And then after the game, we actually had partners lined up to be able to, we had people like the zone and sport 24 and a Japanese sports channel. They would actually create customized highlight packages. Whoever the player of the match was Pete Jones was the player of the match. They would create a, a short 90 second highlight of the amazing things that Pete did during that game. And we'd have it distributed. We'd have it distributed a half an hour after the game. So we work really hard to work media partnerships, technology to make it a really fully integrated campaign. I had a really cool example to show you, but um, I don't have time for it. We're, we're, we, I went a little bit long of just how we work with a partner to actually, we actually got, once the game was over, we actually showed a customized message that looked like it was actually in the game, congratulating South Africa, who won the tournament. Um, in the game, literally in the context of the game, we congratulated South Africa for, for winning the game. And we had the the play-by-play -play announcer who did the voiceover. So if you get a chance, I think we're going to send this around. You guys can look at that link. Um, the other thing is we measured every single thing. Every day, 10 o'clock, Tokyo time, o'clock in the morning, Tokyo time, we had a call with about five or six agencies, six or seven MasterCard people every single day. What worked yesterday? What are we going to learn from yesterday that we're going to apply today? So that kind of like constant measurement is what helped us, is what helped us drive 
you know, engaging rates and success and things like that. So what was our success? There were, from the top left box, there were 10 Rugby World Cup sponsors. Um, nine of them competed for 30% share of voice. We got 70% share of voice of all those 10, um, of all those 10, um, of the, all those 10 marketers. Um, you can see from the bottom right, our engagement rates, we continued to rise our engagement rates. They continued to grow. From a business standpoint, we had four times the market share um, that we had in that market beforehand. To be fair, Japan wasn't our best market in the world, but uh, we grew our market share by 4X and 90% of our brand metrics were positive. So really, really integrated campaign. And I would maintain that integration, um, it's not just creating a cool, you know, one cool piece of copy. It's how do we integrate it is, the, is how we deliver that. Um, real quick, um, and again, sorry, I'm running a little bit long. Um, wanted to talk about the impact of, of COVID. Um, in one month, the media consumption behavior and consumer behavior has completely changed. This one slide shows 95% reduction in, um, in shopping mall traffic. I don't know why it's not higher than that. And if you look on the right side, you can see these numbers from movies to dining to airports, they're all down a lot. Not everything's down. Grocery was only down a couple percentage points. And you can see what they're doing. You know, a 10x increase in um, embroidery challenges, a 13% increase in excuse me, Lego challenges, a 13% increase in embroidery lessons. Jan, you had the example yesterday of like, you know, you've just started doing embroidery and you, you showed your, you know, you showed With your- Peter Ginsburg. 140X uh, increase in homeschooling, that's obvious. So complete change in consumer, consumer behavior from a media standpoint, it's completely changed media behavior. Um, look at the top left box. We've gone from four and a half hours a day to five hours and 42 minutes a day in two weeks. In two weeks, we've dramatically increased 20% the amount of the amount of time we spend watching TV. If you look on the top right box, um, you know, 32%, 132% increase in streaming hours, time spent, and 70% increase in, in regular TV. And it's not, you know, it's not every single medium. News has been great. Um, sports, I'm a sports fan, I'm dying. I can't watch you know, uh, reruns of cornhole tournaments on ESPN. It kills me. So um, not every day part is doing great, but some of them, news, entertainment, they're doing great. Um, and then how about if we take a break here? Uh, I have a whole bunch of questions cool. stacked up. Could we jump into some questions? Yeah, sorry. Sorry we went a little long. Yes. And everybody else, this will be, we'll put this up, we'll link it, we'll have the video and the PowerPoint so you can go through and relook at it because there's such <laughs> valuable, valuable information here. Uh, first question is, what's your best advice for seniors trying to enter the job market? Well, I, I guess it depends on um, where your passion is. If you want to go into media, if you want to be into strategy, or if you want to be an art director or a copywriter, um, it really depends. Um, I always like, I, I've only really been, um, talking to uh, seniors who've gone into the creative direction. Um, and my advice to them is to be a student of advertising, love advertising, uh, look at it, um, try to get a portfolio together, uh, take as many courses as you can that are in the creative field, and uh, talk to people, um, get a network together, and just try to uh, develop um, your craft and take your time. It's okay, you're very young. <laughs> it's okay if you make mistakes, get a job just to get a job, that's okay. Uh, you'll eventually get to where you wanna be and it took me a long time. Yeah, I think that my build would be, it's in Pete, everything Pete said I agree with, it's a really specialized industry. To say you wanna work in advertising, to, you know, to come and talk to Pete and say I wanna work in advertising, if Pete said, do you want to be an account person or a researcher or creative? And you know, don't say, oh, whatever. I mean, have a specific, even if you're just storytelling for that specific interview, have a really specific point and meaning for why you've grown up as a little child wanting to be a market research person. So, so even if it's, even if it's, you know, a little storytelling, have a specific point and specific purpose. Um, 
it's really hard today, right? Today with the with the crisis, it's it's bad. It's not great, right? So Pete, you know, joined in a recession. I I left college in a, in you know in a bad economic downturn as well. Um, neither of those were as bad as it is right now, right today. So today is an interesting time. Um, I am pretty confident that it will, will shake out of it. Um, and also pretty confident that there's so many things to do in our business that there'll be lots of opportunities. If you're creative about, you know, different ways in the door, um, there's definitely opportunities out there. And I have a dovetail question from Jackie who wants to know, with, with this pandemic and all the things that are happening, do you think there'll be permanent changes in the marketing world? And what's that going to look like from a social media and a physical marketing perspective? I'd say yes, but I wish I knew what they were yet. I mean, if we looked at some of the stuff we looked at, like looking at media behavior change, um, I don't know what's going to shake out. It's a little too early to tell. I think there are going to be changes, even like work environment. Pete and I have now learned that we can work from our sunrooms and our basements. Um, I think that will change the amount of time that people will spend, like, you know, spend in the office. I read some uh, yesterday that some car insurance companies are giving rebates because people aren't driving as much. Um, it will change. It will definitely change. I think it's too early to define what that change is. If I look at things like media behavior, will this be a renaissance for more linear TV because people feel disconnected? Or will it accelerate people cord cutting and streaming? I just don't know yet. I just don't know. It's a little too early to tell. We're, we're literally in the middle of it. We're a month in to, and if you see how radical media has changed, it's definitely going to change. I think it's too early to be definitive. Agree. All right. Ryan would like to know for Ben, as a sophomore looking for an internship, are there ways I could get involved with global accounts? Great question. Um, yeah, I think that I would work at, I would work on getting into, um, I would work at getting into agencies. I still said I was an agency guy for 28 years and I, I think it's still the best entree into in marketing communications. You will learn so much more in an agency than you would learn in a company like MasterCard. It's not even fun. Um, so, you know, definitely work on the agency side. I think that the global aspect is depending upon, I assume you're in this country, um, you probably global advertising, you probably got to move to a big, you know, big hub like, you know, New York or LA. I've, you know, I wish there were more things to do in Philly. I love Philly. I would, I would, I wish I lived in Philly. Um, but the, from an advertising standpoint, it's just a little bit less to do for big global accounts. So if you're ready to do the New York thing, um, go pick on agencies and, you know, and keep banging on those doors. And... All right, Pete, I got one for you from Bridget. Do you mind asking Mr. Jones, what inspired the creation of the Fearless Girl? Um, what inspired it? Um, the story is... Uh... Well, it's not really a story. Uh, the account is uh, State Street. Uh, State Street is basically like a, like a Black Rock where they create mutual funds. And they created a mutual fund called the She Fund. And it was a, a fund of companies that were uh, heavily influenced at the C level um, by women, um, either as CEOs, CMOs, um, etc. Um, State Street came to McCann and said, how do you manifest this? How do you talk about this idea? And um, it was one of those projects, uh, again, like the brochure, was something that nobody really wanted to work on. Um, but there were a few um, uh, people who felt like, listen, let's just give it our best and come up with a few ideas. And <laughs> um, it, was, it was actually, Fearless Girl in its earliest conception, a bad idea, it was originally a very bad idea, it was actually going to be a cow. I swear to God, it was going to be a cow facing the bull. Bull and a bear. And the right people um, sort of looked at the ideas and said that that is completely bullshit and the wrong thing to do. 
um, and the right people took over um, and it became a girl and actually went up to the top of our creative um, leadership. And, you know, you just talk about ideas and they develop and sometimes these ideas take over the course of months and then uh, eventually you need a name. And I think Rob Riley actually came up, our CCO actually came up with the name of Fearless Girl. Names are important. And also one thing on like job, like that was not a plum assignment. And like when you're given like not the most exciting assignments at an agency, like just try to make the best, like that, that team made that made made themselves famous out of they were probably picked from the team that wasn't like this was not a plum assignment for a like it's a business to business brand that didn't spend a lot of money like seize those moments to make amazing happen with every opportunity when you're a young when you're you know young up and coming in business well avery would like to know for both of you how has temple university influenced your career and your successes Um, well, my mother went to Temple, and I've always been a Philly guy, and I always felt like Temple is what you make of it, and I, I just um, uh, was, like I mentioned uh, earlier, um, was at the crossroads of trying to figure out what to do. I wasn't doing very well, well academically and realized that advertising was the thing that I could do um, well. Um, and I just felt like Temple had all the resources um, to help me um, get to where I wanted to be. I mean, I uh, would tremendous some after Temple. I mean, Temple, like just the whole culture, diversity, mindset from, I mean, not to get too like bullshitty, but like Russell Conwell's original, like it was like the school for like working people in every day. I mean, mm -hmm. it taught me to, to work hard. It taught me to be inquisitive. It taught me to like work with others, like working groups, things like that. When I, when I teach a class, it's like the group exercise is always the hardest one for people because they like to work in their own little world. In real life, you got to work with people, especially in the marketing communication. You can't work with people. You're not going to live very long working in marketing communications. Um, and also not take myself too seriously. It's like, you know, like, so a lot of those characteristics around Temple, I owe a lot to them. And then that's what I hope all you guys get from all of this. It's a journey. Uh, and there's so many things that Temple has to offer. There, there's a class this fall in pharmaceutical advertising. There's money and jobs to be made in pharmaceutical advertising. It, it, it's a great we have so many tools for you guys. I'll just reach out and use everything we have. Uh, one last question. Uh, uh, pandemic, pandemic. Uh, also, everybody, look in the, there, there's comments and people have been chiming in, all the pe members of the board are on here. There's all sorts of comments in the chat. Um, What's your inspiration from your own personal experiences, Pete? Um, from personal experiences, I, I don't know. Like Ben said, I, 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 I just love Philadelphia so much. And I've, you know, he mentioned it, it's a blue collar town. And um, I feel like um, the influences that I had, uh, you know, with my friends and family um, have just uh, helped me and led me to Temple and to just keep working hard. No one's going to hand things to you. Um, I, I've always felt that way. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a media nerd. I'm a media junkie. I got used to like, I used to watch TV at school and I was studying. I was a radio, television, film major. I'm, I'm a media junkie. So I'm like, this is an extension of my like, passion around the media and, you know, sports and entertainment. Um, so I'm like, I'm a junkie and a nerd around things like that. It's just a natural extension. Um, 
from taking my first FT Marquez, who's no longer, you know, on the, you know, no longer around, but he was my first advertising teacher. Um, yeah, I mean, ever since the first couple of classes, uh, that's connected with my passion for media. Um, the other one, the one thing I wanted to put on the last screen, if you've got any questions, I'm, I'm offering up Pete's, you know, email box, you know, maybe unfairly, but if anybody's got any other questions they want to ask, just, you know, if you want to put me an email, go for it. Thank you both. It was wonderful. Everybody, we will have this posted in a, in a bit after we go through everything. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you learned. I hope you network uh, and enjoy the rest of uh, the semester. Good luck with everything. Stay safe um, and reach out to any of us if you need anything. We'd love to help you. Great. Bye, everybody.